Viruses are not considered alive, bacteria are, and we're going to talk about the structure of those. And then, uh, so the first part of the, the chapter is about viruses, the second part is about bacteria and um, how bacteria uh, reproduce and some things about bacteria that's going to be useful for the next chapter. So we'll also look at how bacteria turn genes on and off. So in 19 and 21, we talked about eukaryotic cells like our cells turning genes on and off. Bacteria cells are a little bit different, and the whole um, organism is only one cell big. Uh, and so whatever they turn on and off affects the whole organism. So we're gonna, that's where we're going to lead um, and, and uh, end with chapter 18. Then we're going to go back to chapter 20. The reason why these go together is chapter 20 is all about DNA technology, um, which means that we as humans have taken what we know about DNA and about viruses and bacteria. This is why these go together, because we um, take what we know about viruses and bacteria and use it and manipulate them to do things that we want to do. And so we manipulate DNA in organisms um, and so on and so forth. So that's what chapter 20 is about. Is, uh, we'll talk about genetic mo genetically modified organisms, what that means, the process in which how somebody would go, in, uh, go about inserting a gene into another organism and allow them to make a different protein than they were able to do at birth, okay? And so, <coughs> so that's what we're going to be doing. And I think I've told you that, um, before that within this unit is when we are going to insert a jellyfish gene into bacteria, um, and the jellyfish gene in the jellyfish produces a protein that um, bioluminesces um, and under UV light or makes them glow like a greenish color. Um, we're going to take the jellyfish gene and put it into bacteria and make the bacteria. All right, and so that is, uh, <coughs> so really we're making, um, it's called a tran transgenic organism, or it would be a genetically modified organism because it does not have as a gene that is different than um, what it was born with from a different organism. All right, so that's kind of where we're going um, in this unit here. So, <coughs> so that lab that I was just talking about, it's a pretty big lab. It's going to take three or four days to, to do, all right, and so... <coughs> So um, this picture here shows you, just to give you a, a mental picture about sizes, this right here is the bacteria, the E. coli. These little guys in yellow are the um, bacteriophages, uh, which are a type of virus that infects that bacteria. And so bacteria are much, much bigger than viruses. So <laughs> let me just give you some overview about bacteria and viruses. So we have an interest in bacteria and viruses, and I've done a lot of studying on bacteria and viruses. Um, really because it makes us sick, all right? So therefore, um, it leads to we want to study it so that we can figure out how to fix it so that we don't get sick or can help us when we do, all right? So they're harmful. A lot of them are harmful or pathogenic. Um, bacteria cause about half of human diseases. Um, they typically cause diseases um, from either endo or exotoxins. Um, exo in front of something, what does that mean? It would be like on the skin, like outside the human. Body. Yeah, outside, yep. And endo would mean inside. So let's look at these. Exotoxins are secreted. So these guys are secreted from the bacteria and can cause disease, even if the bacteria that produce them are not present. So it's the, the toxin themselves that is making us sick, all right? So, so <coughs> not the actual presence of the bacteria, but what it's producing. And endotoxins are released only when the bacteria dies, so it has this toxin inside of it. And when the bacteria dies, it, when it starts to break down, um, it releases, that exotoxin can get out of the cell, and then um, we have adverse reactions to that, or another organism has adverse reactions to that. So this is an example. This is um, a picture of about Lyme disease. You guys have heard of Lyme disease, right? Lyme disease is caused by a bacteria. This is the picture of the bacteria. It's a little spiral bacteria. There's three shapes for bacteria. There's um, circular, all right? There are rod-shaped bacteria, and then spiral shape. So this happens to be a spiral shape. And um, it is carried by ticks. So here's a picture of a tick. All right, what it looks like, they're very, very small. You can imagine that somebody's finger, so very, very small. Uh, and that bact in some ticks can be infected with this bacteria. And so then, um, and it doesn't hurt the tick, this bacteria, but what happens is when that tick bites us, 
and when it bites us, um, it, that bacteria gets into us. And one of the typical side effects is a um, rash that kind of looks like this, that kind of around the tick bite. Uh, the, not everybody gets a rash, um, but that's a typical symptom. And then um, as time goes on, um, uh, people usually get fevers, headaches, fatigue, uh, and so on. And so, <coughs> so sometimes if you don't get a rash, it's hard to diagnose because think about um, headache, fever, fatigue, there's a ton of things that you get those symptoms from. And so if you don't get that typical rash, it's, it's hard, the diagnosis is hard. So therefore, somebody can go untreated for a while. Yeah, my uncle, he was doing yard work, like, in the fall time, and he, like, had a, like, he got bit by a tick, and he had to, like, go get it, like, for, did you, did you burn it out or something like that? You can, yeah. 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 And then, like, probably two months ago, he, like, woke up, and he couldn't feel, like, the left side of his face. It was like drooping, and so they're like, "Oh my gosh!" Like, you, they thought it might be like Lyme disease, and he had to go get tested and stuff. But like, it yeah. ended up being some like random thing, and it went away. There, there's something called Bell's palsy that does does that as well. That can go away. Yeah, yeah it just went yeah. away. But, but yeah, that is a side effect. Is one side of the like face becomes droopy. Another side, side can be because what it does is a, it um, eventually if left on treated because you can treat it with antibiotics and so on um, and usually be fine if you get it early yeah. but it affects your nerves and so on and so in joints and so another symptom is if you have a knee that's slightly swollen than the other one that's yeah. another symptom that um, people get over time um, with that so yeah interesting um, and so <coughs> So this is, there's a whole host of things carried by ticks. I, my um, son, we went to, uh, a couple summers ago, we went to the Pacific Northwest, so um, Washington and Oregon, and we were in Northern California, we went to the Redwood Forest and so on, and we came back, and we were home for two days, and my son broke out in a rash and got a really high fever. Um, took him to the doctor. The doctor called the hospital immediately, admitted them. Um, they, they thought he had um, Rocky Mountain Spotted Fever, which is another tick-borne illness. So, so they were looking all over for a tick bite. We didn't see a tick bite or anything like that. He ended up to be in intensive care for um, eight days. Um, he was, they, they, because they didn't know what it was. We were actually in a room where he wasn't allowed to leave the room and the doctors put on masks and like <laughs> came oh in because they didn't know. It was really scary for a while. So they did the test for the ticks and did a, all these tests for all these different things and it all came back negative. And eventually he got better and so we still don't know what it was. We have no idea what it was, but it wasn't a tick thing. All right, at least it wasn't one that they, they um, they talked about so so <laughs> so it's hard to diagnose it, it's hard to diagnose and so um, were you they, able to see it like you're going yeah we, we were able to go in and and so on but um, they wouldn't let him like we were in Mott's Children's Hospital down in Ann Arbor which is a wonderful hospital for kids they have you know people come in they give them Legos and there's a big playroom and stuff like that but he wasn't allowed to go down to the playroom because he could infect other until they knew, you know, so um, so it wasn't to the last day or, or so that we, he was actually able to leave the room. But anyway, that was, that was a little side story there. All right. <laughs> Off topic, but a little bit on topic because that probably was a virus um, that he had to um, kick, but... Um, and so this picture, just to piggyback on that first picture, this obviously is not a real picture, but it shows sizes. So I've shown this before when we did the cell chapter, where here's the virus, here's the bacteria, and notice in the same picture here, you only get a fraction of an animal cell. And so, <clears throat> so therefore, notice that this right here, this is, um, uh, uh, this is the nucleus here, so therefore um, it is... Uh, much smaller the viruses than any other cell. So let's just talk about the generic structure of a virus. We've talked about this before. Um, it's a genome, which means the genetic material, enclosed in a protective protein coat. So it's, that's the, the basic overview. Uh, they're not considered to be alive. Um, the reason that they're not considered to be alive, anybody know? Ben? They cannot reproduce on their own. So they um, need a host cell with the appropriate things. Because to make new viruses, you need a genome. So like, let's say their DNA. 
and proteins. So what do you need to make new DNA? You need enzymes, DNA polymerase, helicase, all of those things. Um, and what do you need to make new proteins? RNA polymerase, you have to be able to go through transcription and translation. Viruses don't have any of those enzymes, any of those things, so therefore they can't make new DNA or proteins, so therefore they can't reproduce and make more of themselves. All right, so, <coughs> so as the previous picture showed, they're very small, 20 nanometers in diameter, <coughs> smaller than a ribosome. So usually in a cell, that's what the small and large subunit put together. Um, usually in the cell, the ribosomes are just like little dots. Viruses are even, the typical virus, even smaller than that. Viruses are classified based upon their genetic material. So we have learned that our genetic material is DNA, and most of the other organisms on Earth, their genetic material is DNA. For viruses, viruses are unique. They can have DNA as their genetic material or RNA. And then another new thing is that viruses can have single-stranded DNA. So everything that we've talked about so far, the DNA was double-stranded. They can have single-stranded DNA. And, and then also their RNA, we've learned that RNA is single-stranded, but some viruses actually have double-stranded RNA. So, there, so there's a lot of things that are unique about viruses. So they can have double or single-stranded DNA or double or single-stranded RNA. And, and so they call them DNA viruses or RNA viruses based upon their genetic material. So, the, uh, so that's the, the genetic material. Then the protein around it is called, the coat around it is called a capsid. And then some actually have structures that help to infect um, the host cell. They have specialized structures. So an example of that is the viruses that infect us, flu viruses. They have a membrane envelope. And we'll learn later on in the chapter, we'll look at these a little bit more in depth. Um, they're derived from the membrane of the host cell, but it surrounds the capsids of flu viruses, which is what this next picture shows. So this next picture shows a bunch of different... Um, this next picture shows some various different types of viruses and And you can see that they have different shapes. But this one, the flu virus, the influenza, um, you can see it looks a little bit different um, in that. In these pictures, what is colored purple, and each one of these is the capsids. So all of these, this is the protein coat. Notice here, the flu virus has many capsids. All right, capsid, capsid, all in purple. And then the genetic material is colored inside. All right, so therefore you have the genetic material inside the capsid. And then the flu virus looks a little bit different because, as we just wrote here, that they have a membrane envelope that surrounds the capsid, um, capsids. And so they have multiple capsids with this membrane envelope. And so what happens is, is these little structures sticking out here, what those do is help the, the virus to be specialized as far as what type of cell it infects. So remember when we talked about communication and the cell membrane that you have surface receptors on your cell membrane? And um, so the surface receptors on the virus meet and bond with only certain um, surface receptors on certain cells. And so therefore viruses, because of that, viruses can be host specific. So there are certain viruses that only infect humans or only infect cats. Um, and there are some viruses that infect multiple hosts. And then some viruses that only infect humans, but not only won't infect any human cell, but are specialized to a particular um, cell. So for instance, you're the cold viruses. Cold viruses do not, um, do not infect every single cell of your body. These viruses have their surface um, proteins and the surface proteins of our upper respiratory tract bond, and therefore cold viruses affect the cells of our upper respiratory tract, and that's why we get side effects in our up, upper respiratory tract from having a cold. So therefore, their viruses are specific. Um, this virus here is the bacteriophage. Um, that's, we talked about that before. That is um, the one that infects bacteria. So this is specifically for bacteria. Remember, this is the one I said reminds me of a scary toy. <laughs> <laughs> so, 
So, um, that's your bacteria fudge. And um, let me just talk a minute about the tobacco mosaic virus. Um, this was one of the first um, viruses that was discovered. Um, it's called this because um, it infected tobacco plants. So the tobacco plants had these spots on them, so they looked like they were had something wrong with them. And so they were studying to see what caused this virus in tobacco plants um, and couldn't find anything because they were looking for uh, bacteria and so on. And so they figured that whatever is causing this in the tobacco plant is really, really small because you can't see it underneath the microscope. And so then <coughs> what they did is they noticed that if they took a leaf from the infected tobacco plant and rubbed it on leaves of normal, not infected, that the normal ones became infected. So something was being transmitted. All right, so they had to rule out as a toxin and so on. And so what they did is eventually using electron micrographs, you can see viruses underneath the electron microscope, they figured out that it was a virus that was causing this. And so they called it the tobacco mosaic virus. So they have some claim to fame because of that. All right, so there's that guy. All right. So viruses can only reproduce within a host cell, which is um, Ben said, which is why it is not considered alive. Each type can infect a limited range of host cells, which is what I just talked about. And the fit, the quote unquote fit, is between proteins on the virus surface and specific receptor molecules of the host surface. So do they fit together? If they don't, that virus will not infect that particular cell. So as I said, some can infect several species, others infect only a single species. So some examples of that occurring, um, you guys have heard of the West Nile virus, right? West Nile uh, can infect mosquitoes, birds, horses, and humans, so you can see a wide range of host cells, um, versus the measles virus only infects humans. And so, so the specificity varies from virus to virus. Um, and then, um, as uh, we said, the measles virus only affects humans. Most viruses that infect eukaryotic cells like ourselves attack specific tissues. So <clears throat> I use the example of the cold virus only infecting the cells of the upper respiratory tract. Another example, the AIDS virus, which is AIDS virus is HIV, all right? Uh, binds only to certain white blood cells. So we'll, in this chapter, we talk a little bit more about uh, the HIV virus. It's um, in a unique class of viruses in the way it affects its cells. So it affects the cells of the immune system. So a viral infection begins when the genome, the DNA or RNA of the virus, enters the host cell. So the host cell puts in its genetic material. Once inside, the viral genome takes over its host, causing the cell to copy the viral nucleic acid and manufacture viral proteins. Because that's, remember, and it, essentially all a virus is, uh, in the most simple, uh, simplest uh, sense, is the, their genetic material wrapped around proteins. So to make new viruses, it's fairly simple. You just need to replicate the genetic material and use that genetic material to make new proteins. And so the host cell that it infects provides all the things that the virus doesn't have. So what do you need? To, you need nucleotides, you need amino acids, ATP for energy. You need all the enzymes, DNA polymerase, RNA polymerase, all of those things that the bacteria does not need. All right? And so <coughs> that's what this picture, we're going to run out of time, aren't we? All right. So we will, um, I, I'm going to do a little video here. Um, so Second, I'll make it all the way to the lysogenic cycle. What? I saw lysogenic cycle. Sorry, first out. Yeah. First out, make it all the way to the lysogenic cycle. Yes, we, we, we did. Yeah. But you know what? First out, we're. Those two cycles are really important. Those are interesting how bacteria can keep on replicating.
I think Ebola has yeah. a similar shape to the tobacco mosaic virus as well. I saw like circles around the entire cell. Like it has all the binder proteins that are kind of like, like, yeah, binder virus that like encompasses the cell. Like, what it is, like very long and skinny. It's kind of interesting how it like giant noodles. Yeah. Yeah.